History can be found anywhere, even in your own backyard. So join us as we search the land, looking for the stories that helped shape this nation. Come on the porch, grab a drink, and join us for a little bit of history from the homestead. Oh, hey there, history buffs. Welcome to this episode of the History from the Homestead podcast. I'm your host, Thomas Carroll. And on today's episode, we're going to talk about the Allegheny National Forest. Now, the Allegheny National Forest takes in a little over 500,000 acres in northern Pennsylvania. And it's home now to every outdoor activity you can imagine. Lakes, water skiing, fishing, hunting, quad riding. But this forest wasn't always the beautiful, pristine land that we have now. The rapid advancing of technology in the Industrial Revolution pretty much led this entire forest to be logged and mined to a basic wasteland. Then in 1923, it was purchased by the federal government and turned into the national forest that we have now. With help from the Civilian Conservation Corps and the federal government itself, and a lot of time, effort, and work, they were able to return this forest to its beauty beauty that we now see today. And joining me on this show to talk about it is author Robert Hilliard. Now, Robert has written, written on sports history and the outdoors for over three decades, He started as a reporter for the Pittsburgh Tribune Review and has written articles for outlets such as Upland Almanac, Pennsylvania Wildlife, and Pittsburgh History Magazine. In 2012, his first book, A Season on the Allegheny, was published. It quickly hit the top 10 in two Amazon categories and has garnered national attention since its publication. Rob is also currently working on a new book, entitled In Freedom Shadow, it's due out in 2023. And on our website, historyfromthehomestead.com, we will share Rob's uh, Amazon link. And he's going to join us today to talk about the Allegheny National Forest. And if you haven't gotten it, I'll say it plenty of times during the show, but make sure you go out and get a season in the Allegheny. Excellent book. It covers a ton of history. Most of my research for today's show came from his book. So without further ado, let's welcome Rob to the show. Oh, Rob, welcome to the History from the Homestead podcast. Thanks, Thomas. I appreciate you having me on. So uh, today we're talking about the Allegheny National Forest, of which you wrote a book, uh, A Season on the Allegheny, which you spent an entire year or an entire hunting season, I should say, hunting uh, several portions of the Allegheny National Forest for your book. So what uh, what was the idea in place for that? Well, it was, uh, it was very nearly a year. It was about nine months, I think. Um, and the idea was to, and the reason it's called A Season on the Allegheny, is um, the idea was to go up during every hunting season and basically use the those changing seasons as the as the literal seasons change from summer to fall to winter to spring um to follow those hunting seasons um spend all that time on the Allegheny National Forest and use each of those opportunities uh, as it turned out each uh kind of each hunting trip if you will became its own chapter in the book and but to use each of those opportunities as uh, a chance to tell a story about a particular aspect of the Allegheny National Forest. And um, so people always say, oh, your book's about hunting. I'm like, well, it ostensibly it is. But if you if you read it, if you actually count the pages, which I've never done, uh, there's probably about maybe 15 percent of it is actually about hunting. And the rest of it is about the history of the forest um some of the controversies that have gone on there over the years and still some currently 
and uh, and then a lot of it is is about the conservation efforts that uh, are, are again historically have gone on there, and then so, many of those are still uh, actively actively underway. Yeah, and which I anybody that's interested in the outdoors, I recommend the book, and we'll share a link later on because all the research I did for this show today came from your book. I didn't I didn't go to anything else. It's it's fairly complete. It doesn't go into into the intricate details which you would have a book a million pages long if you did that right so uh now we'll move towards the history of the allegheny forest uh which they was initially 1923 was when it became a national forest i believe yep that's correct they're uh they'll be celebrating their 100th anniversary this year as luck would have it um and uh I think it's, it's September, I want to say it was September 24th was actually the official designation date, but um, it was one of the first Eastern National Forests that was designated um, prior to, I think it was, I can't remember all the dates, but I want to say it was like 1911. Um, prior to that, all the National Forests that had been designated were out West. And it's some of the big, you know, open areas, of course, that we can still go and experience today. Um, and then I think it was 1911 that the Weeks Act was passed and that opened up the first opportunity. The, the original law that allowed the, the creation of national forests only allowed them west of the Mississippi. And so with the passage of the Weeks Act, that allowed um, eastern national forests to be created. The first one was, I think, the White Mountain National Forest in New England. And... Um, that was like 1914, 15, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and then, uh, as you said, and, and just a few years later, 1923, the Allegheny National Forest was created. And uh, one of the interesting things there was that uh, when they declared they were going to uh, create this area as a, as a national forest, and it's about a half million acres, it's a little bit over a half million acres today. I think it was just under when they when they designated it and there's been some tracks added over the years, but um, people were almost literally laughing out loud at the idea that that would become a national forest because there weren't any trees virtually. Yeah. And, uh, and so they, you know, kind of jokingly called it the, the Allegheny desert, the Allegheny brushland, everything except the Allegheny national forest uh when that designation was announced and uh, or when it was announced that it was going to be designated um so it's turned into you know quite a beautiful forest today but at the time uh that was kind of the running joke was it was it was a forest without trees so that's right and that's that's where i was was going to kind of head towards because it was there there's two almost if you will two allegheny forests there there's before the logging and after because beforehand it was more of uh, white pine and and so on and so forth and then they just turned it into a barren wasteland literally yeah that 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 is absolutely correct yeah um and uh years ago um i had the opportunity to work on a project uh it's actually uh, spread out across 14 project or 14 counties excuse me in in northern pennsylvania uh called the pennsylvania lumber heritage region and they were designated as a as a Pennsylvania heritage area. And I was fortunate enough that uh, uh, I was actually project manager for the, the creation of the original uh, management plan for that area. And so I only mentioned that because it gave me a great opportunity to. Um, so we spent about 18 months, I think, going through that, but to really dig into the history of the area and get and get paid to do it. So it was, it was a great opportunity to do what I would have done for free anyway. Um, and um, but anyway, so we we went through an extensive uh, study of the history of logging up there. And there, it was kind of in multiple phases. Um, so you had the very early kind of pioneer era, um, which would be. Um, like before 1850 for the for the most part for that area and uh there were some settlers coming in and basically they were just cutting down trees as you said a lot of those white pine um and hemlock and beech those were kind of the three main species of that era and uh, they were cutting them down really just to make space to, to plant crops and create farms 
And um, so that was sort of the first piece of it. And then um, in the mid 1800s, they found out there was a lot of value in that white pine and they were actually used in the shipbuilding industry. A lot of that was east of the Allegheny National Forest because they floated them down the streams and then ultimately down the Susquehanna River to Chesapeake Bay where the very big shipbuilding industry took place. Um, and they would actually lash them together into big uh, rafts and raft them down the river to get to, to where they were ultimately used. Um, there was some of that on the Allegheny because you're a different watershed there coming down to the Ohio and coming to Pittsburgh. That's the first big city anyway. And um, so they did do some white pine rafts coming in that direction, but a lot of those white pines were used for, they call them spars. They were used for the masts on the, on the seagoing ships. So of course that had more value going out of Chesapeake Bay than it did going out of Pittsburgh because there's not many, not many seafaring ships uh, sailing out of Pittsburgh, even, even 150 years ago. So, um, so then that kind of rolled into the next era. Well, also being cut at that time were some of the oak and some of the other species, of course, that we know today. And those were floated down in uh, what they call log drives. And if you can picture like a cattle drive, it was the exact same thing, but with trees, they, they would, uh, of course, the trees don't go, don't run across the land. So they would th throw them in the, in the stream. They would build a dam, uh, let that water get deep behind the dam, throw a bunch of logs in there. And this usually took place over the winter because of the you know, cold winters that we have, and especially up on the Allegheny, you got a lot of snow and ice. It was easier to drag those trees to the water uh, across the snow than across the, the bare ground. Um, they would put them into this artificially created pond and then come springtime when the rains came and snow melted and the water was up, they would, uh, the dams that held them were called splash dams and they would actually, they were on a hinge and they would just drop the hinge and all the uh, water would come rushing out and would carry all those logs with them. And they would go downstream a little ways to the, to the next splash dam, let the water build up again and then and repeat that process until they got into the Clarion River or the Allegheny River that was deep enough for the logs just to float down. And they would go all the way down to um, uh, to sawmills at, again, closer to Pittsburgh. And there they would take them out and saw them up in lumber. And the way, just like cattle, the way they knew the difference is each log, each individual log would have a brand on it from whoever's, whoever's, property was cut from and uh, uh you know whoever had the timber lease and they would take what was called a brand hammer and they would bang it against the cut end of the log and it would mark it with the brand and uh and then when they took it out somebody would be standing there with a ledger you know mark say okay we took 152 uh logs of such and such a size with this brand on it and then that's how they knew what got sawed up at the at the sawmill so um I Interestingly oh, enough, that in it's still pretty similar nowadays in the in the timber business. They still do it a lot of the same way. They still mark them the same way, even even now. But and you know, unlike now, they there was no uh, there was no sense of conservation about it. They cut everything right. absolutely they could cut. So that's I I, I I there's nothing wrong with the timber industry. It's it's a matter of managing it. Which that's is exactly, yeah, that's exactly right. And, and that actually you get to a great point there. Um, and, you know, what was happening at that era, and now we're talking like sort of civil war era. Um, what was happening then was that um, most of the trees, like I was just describing the process there, most of the trees were being cut were closer to streams. And then just a few years after that, the railroad, uh, and those were narrow gauge, uh, small railroads that were built specifically for logging that let them reach pretty much every stick of woods on the forest. And just as you said, they cut them all down. Uh, they cut everything they could get. Also around that time, um, they started using hemlock for tanning leather. And that created a whole new market for the few trees that they hadn't already cut, which were hemlock trees. There wasn't a whole lot of market for prior to that. Now, all of a sudden they had value. So they they whacked them all down and um, and there was no thought like there is today, uh, really, since uh, probably about the 19, well, around the time that the National Forest was created, 1920s, and 1930s. Um, there was broad 
um, application of conservation principles in, in logging. Uh, prior to that, it was just get it down, get it out, get get whatever money you could for them. And there were a couple of impacts of that. One, of course, uh, terrible erosion because there was nothing to hold the soil in place. Uh, two, um, they left the, the stuff that didn't have any value, which was the, the treetops, sticks, and all those things. And they just left them piled sometimes 15, 20 feet deep on the ground. They called them slashings. And just as you might imagine, when those things start drying out, they become unbelievably flammable. And I think we'll get to the forest fires a little bit later, but um, uh, that was really a, a terrible outcome because those things would just burn and then they would burn over again and burn over again. Um, and then, um, but the other, the other thing would happen is those companies would move uh, when, when all the logs were gone, all the, anything that had any value off of it was gone off of their lease. They would move on and just leave the property sit empty and when the, the U.S. government acquired the land for the Allegheny National Forest, most of it was through tax defaults because those companies had moved on to Michigan or Wisconsin or even Washington State and just left it sit. That you know had no value to them. It was just it was just a burden at that point. So they let it go. Taxes were in arrears, and uh, like I said, when the government bought it up, that's that's how a lot of Pennsylvania state forests were acquired as well. Um, because they they were just acquired for because the taxes were in arrears because uh, they were essentially abandoned property at that point. So that was a maybe the only positive outcome of uh, of that process there. And then again, as you I mean you hit the nail on the head, the the modern era, really the modern era of of forestry and timber cutting is a different industry altogether. There's there's other than the fact that they produce wood, there's almost no comparison to how it was yeah. done a hundred plus years ago. Um, yeah. They they manage everything. It's almost more of a farming process, um, and it's the ultimate renewable resource. Really, right? and and that and that heads to the the other point I was going to make because they actually managed when the national forest took over. They managed it for continued timber production. They managed it for black cherries and stuff. So they didn't come in and say, whoa, no more cutting. You know, right. the national forests and stuff, they still timber and and so on and so forth as a sustainable, that's what their slogan, a land of many uses. That's exactly right. And that actually, actually, that's a really good point that I should probably, I should have probably touched on at the outset, but there's an important difference that some people don't understand or, or, or recognize there's an important difference between national forests and national parks. They are so distinctly different. They have completely different missions, but they're not even run by the same organization within the government. The, the national forests are run by the United States Department of Agriculture. So the Forest Service is a branch of the USDA. Um, national parks are through uh, the Department of the Interior. And so they're more focused typically, and, you know, there's, it's a massive land holding across you know all 50 states so there's a lot of variability but the park service is typically focused on what i would loosely term preservation and that is keeping it as it is in in as much the uh, the condition that that we found it in if you will um that as can be but the forest service manages national forests and, and again you said it it's land of many uses is is one of their slogans um the father of the forest service um was a guy named uh, pinchon who was uh pincho excuse me gifford pincho who later became governor of pennsylvania a little bit of trivia there um and uh, in fact he was governor he was a little, uh, came into office the year the Allegheny national forest was uh, was designated in 1923 but prior to that, he was the first director of the U.S. Forest Service. And his slogan for National Forest was, um, and I won't get this right, I should have it memorized and I don't, but it was um, the mo uh, best use providing the most for the most people or something close to that. So forgive me, I, I didn't quite hit that right. But, <laughs> but the idea being exactly what you said, that um, it could be used for timber. It could be used for water resources. Uh, there are places where um, oil and gas resources. 
And but the idea of a sustainable use that could be continued over time, and again, a lot of those are timber in particular are um, renewable resources, and that it would be managed for those outcomes. So from the very beginning, the national for the idea of the national forest was more conservation, conserving it. So we're using some, but saving some for later. But but we will continue to use it over time versus preservation, which is more typical of what you would see in the park service, national parks. And, and now we, we're talking about the managing stuff too. Uh, there's another organization that definitely need to bring up that helped with that. It was the Civilian Conservation Corps. A lot of people might not even know what that was, but that was big, really big around the Depression era. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Um, the CCC, as everybody refers to it, uh, was one of the um, FDR. I'll just start throwing out three-letter uh, acronyms here. But <laughs> when, when Franklin Roosevelt came in office, um, it, a lot of us, at least a lot of us my age, learned in history class. Uh, he had a series of programs that came out to address uh, the Depression, try to fix the Depression, in his first 100 days. He said that well, when I come in in my first 100 days, I'm going to put these programs in place. And one of those was the Civilian Conservation Corps, CCC. And it was actually one of the very first uh, batch of, of his 100 days projects and, or his New Deal projects. Um, it was, uh, I want to say it was approved in April of 32. And uh, by September, they were opening uh, CCC camps. And ultimately, to kind of skip to the end of that story, it was only in place for about nine years. Um, started in, in uh, I'm sorry, I said 32, it was 33. Started in 33, ended in 42. Um, but in that space of time, there were about 3 million young men. They were all between about 18 and 21. And, uh, but, but about 3 million young men across the U.S. went through the CCC program, um, including my grandfather, I'll, I'll come back to that at the end. I, um, and but they were also not, another one of the the colloquial names for the CCCs became uh, Roosevelt's Tree Army, and they ultimately planted about three billion—that's billion with a B—trees uh, across the United States. And the there were really two two ideas. It was kind of killing two birds with one stone. Uh, one was we had all these abandoned, uh, you know, forest, well, brushlands or, or uh, again, you know, like the Allegheny Desert. Um, Northwestern Pennsylvania wasn't the only place that had that. So there were a lot of those across the country. There were also places um, out in the Midwest where we were experiencing the Dust Bowl. Um, and so there were a, a large number of conservation problems across the country. The other thing is because of the Depression, there were a large number of young men who were unemployed who were basically just kind of loafing around. And um, for those of us who have been young men at one time or another, or no young men, one of the worst things you could have is a bunch of them sitting around doing nothing because they'll think of really bad ideas uh, for things to do and, uh, and get into trouble. So, uh, Roosevelt and his staff kind of looked at these two situations. So, well, we got a bunch of people who need something to do to keep them out of trouble. And we got a bunch of stuff that needs to be done. So we're just going to mash those two things together. And when they did, they came up with the Civilian Conservation Corps. And um, so they planted trees. Um, that was what they were most widely known for. Um, but they built roads. They built um, dams. Um, they built pavilions and picnic areas and a lot of those you can still go to not only national forests but even state parks across across the whole U.S. but certainly in Pennsylvania and see uh, some of those still standing buildings and again dams and roads and, and swimming areas um, that are that are still here today you know almost 100 years later 90 years later um, that were built by the CCCs. So. Yeah. And, and it's good to mention them because not only did they plant trees, which would kind of lead us into the second part of it, they they helped with with wildlife management to a degree, even because when you think about wiping out a half a million acres of woods, 
you wipe out the animals that go with it, including with overhunting, like our eastern elk and uh, wolves and the eastern cougar. They're all they're all gone. Like we have elk in PA now, but those those were imported, and right. they had a big hand in helping with count populations and stuff too while they were in camp. Yeah, that's exactly right, and that was uh, that was one of the things that was really kind of interesting to me. Um, in doing the research for the book, because I knew about the CCCs. Um, although I mentioned my grandfather again, I'll come back to that at some point, but I didn't know he was in the CCCs until after the book was published. Unfortunately, I wish I had known that or I'd have rolled it in there. Um, he always talked about being in the service and he was in the army for a little while, ended up with the medical discharge and then went into the CCCs. But um, yeah, I didn't know any of that at the time I was writing the book, but um they the Allegheny National Forest had well one thing I did want to mention they actually had the first working CCC camp in the country uh that was at During uh which is a little kind of village um uh, that's that you can still go to today on the forest um and uh technically I think it was called camp number one was outside of was in Virginia not too far from Washington DC technically that was the first one that was open um but as as most of your listeners will know uh franklin roosevelt had polio wasn't very mobile so they set up a camp close to washington dc that he could go to for kind of a photo op um and say hey here's our first ccc camp and they had some things set up and going there but really the first working camp um the non photo op category <laughs> was was it during on, on the Allegheny National Forest and they were again doing all the things that, that I mentioned so um, ultimately there were 16 camps on the Allegheny National Forest and to your point about doing wildlife counts um, that was something I didn't know about prior to to working on the book and it wasn't even in the chapter on the CCCs I was doing research on on some of the habitat restoration and those things that you know you talk about and I found these old records uh, through the Forest Service that I guess they thought, well, you know, we got a big army of guys here. How can we take advantage of this? So they would actually go into some of these areas that were starting to regrow and they would put all the CCC boys in a line and they would go through maybe a, I don't know, 10 acre or 20 acre patch. And they would say, everybody has to stand within six feet of each other so you can see each other. And then just walk at the same pace, almost as if you were, uh, well, was, we used to go small game hunting when I was a kid. We, we put on a drive and walk just like that. Uh, they would walk like that, but they didn't have guns. And they would note every, literally every animal that they saw. Now, unfortunately, at that time period, there weren't nearly as many animals. They weren't seeing as much as what we might today. Um, but they would, you know, they walk through that patch and then everybody would, would compare their notes and they would say, well, we saw, you know, um, three snowshoe hares, five cottontail rabbits, whatever, you know, whatever it might have been, like 20 grouse. And they would write all that down. So they have all these really extensive records from uh, the 1930s of exactly how many animals were in certain plots on the Allegheny National Forest, which I'm a biologist by trade. So that's a, that was fascinating information to me. So. Well, that's perfect. And I, I mentioned the elk, which that's probably the, the most famous thing that they're also known for up there is, is our elk now, which, you know, they were imported from Colorado, I believe, right? They're, they're bigger than what we used to have. Yeah, and it's it's yes, they were uh, imported from Colorado. I want to say that was in maybe also in the early twenty. No, I'm, I'm going to say that was in the late teens, if, if memory serves. Uh, and they brought them in by train cars, um, and somewhere out there, I've actually seen some video. I think through the Game Commission um, of where they, you know, they brought these elk out, got them off of the train cars, you know, let them out in the woods and let them go. Um, and they did come from Colorado, as I said, or as you said, um, there, it's a little hard to know how they compare in size to the Eastern elk, which as you said, is now extinct. And the problem is we don't have any good record of, of the Eastern elk. Like we don't have, there's no photos, obviously. Uh, the last one was killed about 1868. Uh, again, that was the last one in Pennsylvania. Um, that it, 
it was killed in the area that is now the Allegheny National Forest, um, which tells you that that area has always been a bit of a, a sanctuary because it is so remote. Um, the last wolf in Pennsylvania, you mentioned wolves earlier too, uh, it was also killed in that same area. So even as those, as those wildlife populations were shrinking during that unregulated hunting era at that time when they were, we were chewing up all their habitat, the places that they were retreating to were, were really to the Allegheny National Forest, or at least the, what is now the Allegheny National Forest. Um, the elk that we have in PA today are descended from those early elk um, that were that were brought here from Colorado. Um, they're not, um, at least anybody's knowledge, they're not actually on the Allegheny National Forest. Of course, they roam around, so they one of them might pass through there. Um, they're in Elk County, appropriately enough, and and the western part of Elk County is in the National Forest, but most of the elk population is in eastern Elk County, so uh, just, you know, not that many miles away, but, um, and then over into Cameron County as well. Um, See, there, but, there's uh, there's something I learned. I, I always thought they were also on the Allegheny uh, National Forest, though. So. But, and and since you're a biologist, this is kind of off topic, but it's more of a personal curiosity than anything. I've been trying all the years the elk have been there. They they never really seem to have expanded from that little core. Well, call it little as a as an understatement. It's a sizable <laughs> plot too. But right, why they've never really expanded out from there? I've all you know. Well, that's an excellent question. So, um, the reason. Or, or a primary reason is what what you mentioned about them being brought in from somewhere else. So the elk that were here, um, the eastern elk, the original elk, were more of a woodland species, like deer. And they were adapted to live in wooded areas because they did. Um, the elk that were brought in from out west, and if anybody's ever been out west, a lot of where you see elk there or in these grassy meadows and so they're actually adapted to more of a grassland habitat um part of the reason that they were able to to hang on in the area where they're they're at there in elk county is again it's very remote and they they well they get a lot of disturbance today because they get a lot of, over a hundred thousand visitors a year going in there but back in the you know 30 40 50 60s um it was pretty remote, but that was also an area that was heavily strip mined for coal. And when those strip mines started recovering, they were planted with or or just had grassy species come in um, that grew and because it took longer for the trees to come back. So you had a lot of open grassy areas that is unlike most of the rest of Pennsylvania. And so that's why the elk, you know, really were able to hang in there in that specific area for that long. Um, and again, the elk population that at one time I think was as low as 50 or 70 animals. It's closer to 1,000 today. Um, but it, it had dipped down to those small numbers in the 50s and 60s. Um, but, uh, but that's why they were able to kind of hang on that area because it was the trees were all cleared for, again, for logging, but also for strip mining. And so you had some grassy openings, uh, fairly expansive, if anybody's ever seen a reclaimed strip mine. Um, so that's where they were, you know, that was kind of created some habitat that they were more suited to. Um, the elk don't typically eat, they will if they're starving, but they don't typically eat uh, like buds and branches off of trees like a deer will. Um, but they, their favored um, food or fa favorite habitat, but favorite food is, is actually grass. And that's what they're biologically, you know, that's what their digestive system is set up to, to handle. So. And then that that was off topic. That was more of a mild curiosity of mine than anything. But, <laughs> sure. So we we'll move back to the Allegheny Forest now, which you mentioned your grandfather. So I'm gonna I'll circle back to that. I'll I'll force you to get to that now. How's that? Fair enough. Um, Fair enough. I I I was reading in your book. Your your family has had property up there since World War II times, somewhere in there. Yeah. Yeah. My um. So. Yeah, there's a couple of things there, but um, my grandfather, on my dad's side, bought a share of a camp 
Um, and so, I mean, that there's a whole sort of camp culture around Northern Pennsylvania and particularly on the Allegheny National Forest. And one of the things to mention there is I, I said, you know, there's 500,000 acres, 500,000 plus that the U.S. government owns. But there are a lot of tiny little inholdings, some of them as small as a quarter of an acre that are still privately owned. So you're not allowed to live as a private citizen. You're not allowed to live on or have a camp on uh, national forest property. But when you drive through there, you'll see all these camps because they're on all those little inholdings. And after World War II, um, you know, with all the prosperity that came to the United States and, and, and the cars, maybe more importantly, that came to the United States, people started traveling to places like the Allegheny from, from slightly further away. My, my family's from Butler County, which is uh, two and a half, three hours away. And but a lot of guys coming back from the war, they started buying camps and they would go up there and go hunting because that was the place where the deer were at that time. And really at that time, when you're talking about hunting, it was, it was deer hunting. There wasn't, you know, small game hunting was pretty big. That was more in farm country. Um, there were virtually no turkeys. So turkey hunting was almost non-existent. There was really no archery hunting. Um, it was it was rifle hunting for deer, and that was the big the big item. So a lot of guys bought. I say guys were mostly men, but uh, hunting camps up there. My my grandfather on my dad's side um, had a share in a camp. Unfortunately for me, he sold that share uh, before I was born, probably before I was even thought about. Uh, but we were still friends with the family who owned it. So we did go up there a couple of times when I was a little boy, <laughs> which is now a long time ago. Um, and then my great grandfather uh, on, the, on my mom's side uh, had a camp up on the National Forest. And he, again, unfortunately for me, sold that uh, when I was, I don't know if it was before I was born or when I was very young, but uh, I remember we drove past it a few times. Uh, when I was a kid and my folks pointed it out to me and said, you know, that was Pat Pap's camp at one time. Um, but we never, never actually went there. So, um, so yeah, coming back to the CCC, another real, real important point I want to mention is probably the most important function. I've already talked about a bunch here, but the most important function that they served on the Allegheny was firefighting. And again, you had this, you know, thousands of young men. And one of the quotes that I remembered from, there's a gentleman named Mike Schultz who'd done extensive research on the CCCs. And I really leaned on some interviews with him and, and reading his, his papers and, and writing that part of the book. And um, he had a quote that really stuck with me. He said, fire season with all the slashings and things that I talked about earlier, fire season was feared like the coming of diphtheria. It was that much of a it was that much of a regular occurrence, and it was that much of a terrifying occurrence when it when it came. So fast forward to the 1930s, uh, you had a, you know a, almost a literal army of guys out there, and you could stick a shovel in everybody's hand and say, "Okay, go out there and put out that fire," uh, or put a bucket in their hand, or you know whatever it was. And they dug fire breaks, they cleared areas so the fires couldn't jump from one place to another and kept them contained. Um, they, they broke up and controlled burned some of the slashing piles so the fuel was gone. And then, of course, they planted trees to, to make sure that that didn't happen again. So uh, I just want to make sure I touched on that because, uh, again, that was probably the most important uh, function that they served, at least on the Allegheny, because of the conditions that existed there. Oh, absolutely. And and that's important to note because we can see you know, usually what we have out west now during fire season, which is coming up. If it hasn't started, it's coming rapidly. Yep. And it's even with modern technology. That's that's a lot to, to handle. That's a that's a major problem. Yeah. Yeah, you're exactly right. And, and, and I. Sorry, go ahead, Rob. No, I was just going to say we could have <laughs> have probably a whole other series of podcasts mm -hmm. on forest management and yeah. how it's done properly or not being done properly and how that leads to forest fires and all that stuff. But I don't think, uh, I don't think you have time. Yeah. And well, I think this is a good part. I wanted to put a little, a tidbit in there. I had noted to give everybody an idea of the job. Like you, we said earlier that it's 513,175 acres is what I have listed. So I, I did some on that. That is, just a touch over 801 square miles 
Now to think about that, the state of Rhode Island is only 1,500 and some square miles. Yeah. So our forest is nearly half the size of the state of Rhode Island. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that is, uh, it's the only national forest in Pennsylvania. Um, and it's kind of mid-sized uh, when compared to some of the other Eastern national forests. Um, and then when you get out West, they're, you know, millions of acres. And uh, so they're, yeah, they're crazy big. So. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and we, we talked about timber. There's another, there's one more little, little tidbit in there too. There is a, if I'm not mistaken, a small, a small stretch of virgin timber left that was left behind. It was there untouched. Are, yeah, there are actually a couple little pieces. Um, the uh, Heart's Content is one area that has, uh, I want to say they have about 120 acres of white pine forest, uh, if I remember correctly. And that was owned by uh, uh, one of the timber barons of, of the 1800s. And they liked that area so much that they just put a little preserve around it and put their own little camp in it and never they cut everything around it and basically up to that little sliver but not more than that and then there's um uh the tyanest uh wild or uh, wild and scenic area which uh, um that's a couple thousand acres again i don't remember the exact uh number off the top of my head but um that it was also or is also um that virgin forest that we talked about, that that kind of white pine beach hemlock forest, um, and that's uh, that's situated in the headwaters of, of Tyanesta Creek, uh, almost almost dead center in the middle of the Allegheny National Forest, um, and you can still go and walk through there today. And then the Hickory Creek Wilderness, I think not all of it is um, is virgin timber, um, but a portion of it is. And uh, so those are all areas that people can go. And I should probably correct one thing there that I use the term just now. A lot of people use the term virgin forest or virgin timber. Um, an important note there is that's what was that's what was there when the first white people got there uh, and started exploring it. That's what the forest looked like then. But the prior to that, and, and as one of the archaeologists from the Forest Service on the Allegheny told me, uh, really all the way back to the last ice age. Um, the natives who lived in that area and and really prior to uh, the, the white uh, settlers coming in, they managed the forest. So people think in a way like, well, they were just kind of living there and they were living off the land and all that kind of stuff. Um, they were no different than we are in, in terms of understanding what they needed from the land and uh and then knowing how to get it and so they would cut areas now they didn't have the obviously mechanized equipment and they really didn't even have um you know teams of crews with crosscut uh two-man crosscut saws uh, like they did in the 1800s but um but they would go out they would burn off the timber and leave cleared areas and then uh, as those areas started to recover, that would attract wildlife because you got blackberries and you got, you know, all, all the things that wildlife like. And that brought the game into those areas. And then they went in and harvested the game. Um, they also like the blackberries like I do and like a lot of people do. So they <laughs> they essentially farmed, you know, on a landscape level. Um, so, again, we think of that as um a native or a virgin forest but that's really not i mean that forest is only a few hundred years old and you know to go back to the last ice age that's like 10,000 15,000 years so there was a lot happened that's yeah. true probably probably the more proper way would say almost old growth old growth yeah. forest would be the more yeah. proper way to say it to yeah o old growth by our by our current definition yeah that's great yeah. It, it's funny you mentioned it because I, I wasn't really going to bring it up, but it, it's a part of it was was corn planter, which there's a little state forest now. But yep, most of his stuff is under the Kinzu in, under the Kinzu Dam now. That is correct. Yeah. And um, there's that is probably uh, so there are two chapters uh that are the most popular ones by far in in the book uh that people mention to me every time i talk to them uh one which i 
we we'll probably won't get into on this discussion, but it's, it's chapter three, which was the trip down the, uh, the canoe trip down the uh, Clarion River and all the crazy things that ensued along that trip, including, I'll, I'll just, I'll tease this. And for anybody who knows the Allegheny National Forest, they'll laugh out loud when they hear it, but uh, an evening at the Halton Hilton, and uh, which is one of the bars located along uh, Clarion River. But uh, so that's, that is one of the more, most popular and the other most popular chapter is the one on the Allegheny Reservoir and the Kinzu Dam. And as you said, the, the discussion that always comes up on that is, uh, is corn planter. And to, uh, to kind of very quickly capsulize that story, which spans 170 years or something like that. Um, yeah, corn planter was a uh, Seneca Indian chief um <clears throat> who uh lived at the time of uh the french and indian war and then the american revolution and he had after the close of the uh of the revolution uh he lived in the area that's now northwest pennsylvania and or now the Allegheny national forest and um he had signed a treaty with uh george washington uh, to basically set aside a, a reservation for his people uh, in, in that area. And it was the, I believe it was the first uh, treaty signed by the new American government with um, uh, with an Indian nation. Prior to that, of course, all the treaties have been signed with the British because we were still British colonies at that time. Um, so it was uh, the first treaty and therefore the longest standing treaty Um and so corn planter lived out his life there, passed away, was buried along the Allegheny River on a, on a mountainside overlooking the river. And, uh, and then generations later, um, there's, there were, uh, as you know, populations grew, cities grew uh, in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s, there started um, occurring flooding problems uh, downstream in, in some of the major river cities, Pittsburgh notably, and even further down Cincinnati on the Ohio River. And so they looked at a variety of solutions and what they came up with was to build a flood control dam, actually a, a couple of flood control dams, but specifically on the upper Allegheny to build what became uh, known as the Kinzu Dam. Um, and what, one sort of interesting sideline there, one of the other um, potential solutions that they looked at was to build a canal from the upper Allegheny all the way over to Lake Erie, um, which when you think about that now, that seems like kind of a crazy undertaking uh, to, you know, to do that, to divert those floodwaters. But, uh, but that was one of the things that received serious consideration. Um, so at any rate, that plan kind of floated around for several years. Um, like a lot of government uh, potential projects, it took decades to get underway and, and, and ultimately get in motion. Um, the 1936 St. Patrick's Day flood in Pittsburgh was really a big driver to uh, finally get that going. That was the worst flood that uh, the city of Pittsburgh has ever had. Um, we just saw some video earlier this week from that, because uh, St. Patrick's Day, I guess it was uh, a little bit over a week ago, but anyway, uh, people paddling around in rowboats in downtown Pittsburgh and uh, so it was pretty, pretty severe situation, but anyway, um, so by the time that that project to build the dam finally really got momentum, uh, World War II interrupted it. So after World War II, they, they really started, um, trying to move forward with it. And of course the Seneca people who lived in that area, a big part of the reservation was going to be flooded by the construction of the dam. And including, as it turned out, uh, corn planters' burial place. Um, so they found <clears throat> um, they they tried to undertake a lot of different ways to uh, stop the project. Um, ultimately, they filed a lawsuit, which went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And there, um, and this was during the Kennedy administration. Uh, so we went really from the from the George Washington administration all the way to the to JFK. Um, and, uh, but that ultimately they lost that case in the Supreme court and that gave the go ahead for the dam to be constructed. Um, that was a big, um, newsworthy event at the time. 
Uh, there were protests. Johnny Cash actually I, I mentioned this in the book, actually wrote a book. I'm sorry, wrote a song, um, a protest song called As Long as the Grass Shall Grow, specifically about that situation. Uh, but again, ultimately, um, all those efforts failed and the dam was constructed. So they moved corn planters, burial place, um, further out of, out of the area where the flood zone would have been up kind of up the mountain and to the west a bit. And um, and so the Kinzu Dam was constructed. And um, as it turns out, it's one of the most popular uh, recreation sites, not only in the Allegheny National Forest, but in all Pennsylvania today. Um, but, you know, it came at the price of, uh, of that happening. There were several other villages, non- um, not not Seneca Nation villages, but just small villages that were there. There were also uh, the properties condemned, per purchased up uh, under eminent domain, and uh, and those towns were flooded as well when uh, when the dam was constructed. So it didn't come without a a human cost. Right, and for a little bit of a, a tidbit side note, there's if anybody has never been up there, there's still Native American reservations there, just north across the line into New York, and that. Yep. Um, yeah, and it, it's fairly vast. It's actually interesting. They, their road signs up there are both in English and the native language. Yeah, that's well. true. It's kind of neat. Yeah, yeah. I hadn't thought about that, but uh, we used to drive through there a fair amount. My daughter was going to college uh, up in Massachusetts, so we used to drive uh, across the what is that New York Thruway or something like that? I think it's I eighty six maybe. And uh, yeah, it cuts through the reservation and you see those signs up there. That's exactly right. And I think a portion of that reservation still comes down into Pennsylvania on the west side of the Allegheny Reservoir, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd almost have to look at a map. Yeah, same here. It's been a while since I've done that. But yeah. But uh, so now we've talked extensively about the history of the forest and we wouldn't do it any we wouldn't do any justice if we didn't talk about the present and the future because it it's one of those rare pieces of history we don't only get to just look at you get to enjoy it and touch it and and run all over it if you want you can you have free yeah, rain there pretty much <laughs> that's exactly right and uh we talked earlier about uh you know some of the differences between the park service and um the forest service and uh, one of the things when you said about, you know, having free reign, obviously you can't do whatever you want. But uh, one of the things that I point out to people all the time is you can go on to a national force. And I'm, I'm, I know you can do it on the Allegheny. I'm pretty sure you can go to any national force in the country. And if you want to go tent camping, you can just go out to an area. There's a few areas that are restricted, like some of the, the natural areas and things. But you can just go out and drop a tent on the ground, and I think you can camp for, there's some limit, I don't know, three days or five days or something like that. They don't want people setting up a permanent residence there and calling it camp, but uh, you can throw a tent on the ground and, and camp, no no fee, no permit, no, no nothing. Um, so that's actually one of the great things about the, uh, the National Forest, as opposed to, again, the Park Service system, um, you have to have a permit to uh, well, actually, most of the national park sites, you have to you have to pay just to go in the the, the literal front door, the gate. Um, so, you know, the national forest, like you said, you kind of have some uh, free reign there. Um, yeah, as far as where the forest is today, I mean, there's certainly it's not without controversy. We talked a little bit uh, earlier about the uh, timber industry and the Allegheny National Forest is still one of the most. Um, well, historically, it was certainly one of the most industrialized uh, areas that is that is now a natural for, or national forest. Um, there are still logging projects that go on there, as there are in a lot of the national forests across the country. There's controversy about every one of those uh, every time. Um, and, you know, you're always going to have that push pull of people who don't want anything cut and probably far on the other side, people who want to cut every stick and it's, you know, finding that right balance in between there. And, and as we talked about, the the forest industry today is not, um, you know, that's not their model anymore, right? They're, 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 they're growing, they're farming trees. In effect, they're, they're growing for, or I should say they're cutting for uh, that next generation of trees and making sure that they come back healthy and, and that we're maintaining healthy forests. 
Um, but again, there's always going to be opposition to that as well. So that that's an ongoing controversy. I just saw maybe earlier this week um, that uh, I saw a notification that the Forest Service is posting a, um, a timber project on the Allegheny. And uh, they always post those for public comment. And there's a whole process that has to be gone through. So um, it is still and, and probably will remain, you know, for the rest of my life and, and hopefully for generations to come, uh, a fantastic place to just go for recreation. And whether that recreation is hunting, or hiking, camping, uh, the very first sentence in my book kind of touched on that, like, we have the, all these national forests out there, and whether you're, you know, whether you're a hunter, a hiker, um, somebody who thinks that every single tree should never be touched, or somebody that that thinks that they can, you know, those forests can serve as as a resource for us. Um, the those the forests still belong to all of us. Every every single one of the people and every single one of the cat. Maybe even if you're somebody who lives in a city and will never go to a national forest, uh, still belongs to you. And, uh, and it's there for you to, to take advantage of it. So um, I really enjoy, I don't get up there as often as I want to, which is, you know, I'd be going every week if I got there as often as I wanted to. <laughs> I'm just not able to do that. But, um, but I enjoy every minute when I'm there. Um, and uh, again, whether that's hunting or just going up and going up to the elk area uh, we talked about and then, you know, make a little jaunt over and go hit the national forest. My wife and I just went up, uh, it was last fall, uh, did a, a kayak trip on the, on the Clarion river. Um, and uh, again, just, just every opportunity I get to go up there, you know, I try to take advantage of it. Sometimes we go up and go to the little stores and shop antiques or, um, you know, do some of those things too. And uh you know, all those opportunities are there to take advantage of. Yeah. And that's, what's great. And, you know, I've never, I've never hunted or fished there. I've traveled through the forest hundreds of times being a truck driver in a tractor trailer with no, <laughs> right. no way to stop. And I, al I always threaten to go up and visit, which, which brings us to your book, because as we said at the very beginning, the book you wrote, you spent about every season you could, you could get up there to hunt from uh, from what you said, from duck season through the late after Christmas muzzleloader. Yeah, actually through through spring turkey the following. So I, I went from Labor Day to Memorial Day of uh, 2004 and 2005, I think was the year that I did it. Yeah, and that, and that gets me, I, won, I was trying to find a way to to compare every bit of the forest and it's it's good and not so good history. And the easiest way I thought I just thought of it last night was camaraderie. Because if you think about it, the the Indian nations, you know, when they sat around in the evening, there was camaraderie there. Yep. Even in the logging camps, it was there. The CCC, it was there. And the one the one that really made me think about it was if anybody that's in Pennsylvania knows about the first day of rifle season. Yep. That is at the time, I believe it was still on Monday when you wrote the book. It's been moved to Saturday now, but it was That's Monday correct. after Thanksgiving. <clears throat> and it, it's it's pretty near a, a statewide holiday. Schools close, businesses close. It's Yep. I, I was actually in college before I realized that not every school in Pennsylvania <laughs> closes on, on uh, the first Monday in, in uh, after yeah. Thanksgiving. Yeah, and it, it, no, it's just, it just hit me to, to really think about that's what's important up there because you just said it yourself what do you go up there for you spend time with your family and it's a beautiful perfect place for that yep yeah no and that, that you make a really good point i hadn't really thought about it that way before but it is a uh i mean it's a special area like you said we talked about some of the history some not so good some some fantastic like you know we talked about some of the uh animal species being really knocked back um but the the great part about that story is their recovery and you know they were at the point where they were they were restocking deer which is impossible to think of today um, but they were bringing in deer from Michigan because there weren't enough deer in Pennsylvania and, and the Allegheny National Forest was one of the places that they were restocking them. Um, and then, you know, that the recovery to, 
where, you know, in some parts of the state, they're, they're now a nuisance animal. Um, and, uh, and uh, wild turkeys is another one. And that we talked about the CCCs doing those game uh, surveys and notably not one turkey, not one turkey listed. And uh, again, now, you know, decades later, they're, they're, I don't know that they're a nuisance, but it's nothing to drive down the road and see turkey stand in the field in, in 95% of Pennsylvania, including the city. So, um, but anyway, your point about camaraderie is, is dead on because you had, as you said, the camaraderie of CCC camps prior to that, you know, for, for, we talked about 10,000 years, you had people sitting around a campfire. Um, there were even, uh, one specific area, Buckaloons, uh, that I touched on in the book, there was a native American village there that dates back almost to the, to the previous ice age. And so those people did have all that camaraderie. And the reason that they did is what's still there today on the forest. You have, you have the rivers, which are, you know, just fantastic for like, like I mentioned, kayaking, canoeing, boating, whatever you might want to do. Water skiing up on the reservoir. I mean, that you can do just about any kind of water sports you want to up there fishing. And um, so they, you know, they celebrated that in, in their way for, generation after generation after generation. And then there was kind of a brief relative to 10,000 years, a brief period of time there where it was just looked at from the resource standpoint. But like you said, certainly in the logging camps and I've read stories about how people got together there and they still have a celebration. They call it Woodhick Days at the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum, uh, which is just east of the National Forest. I highly recommend for you or anybody who's interested to, to go there and, and spend a couple of days. But um, they have uh, tobacco spitting contest at Wood Hit Days, and they had you know just the kind of things that would happen in in the camps. Um, I, they have a, a log rolling, burling, it's called uh, contest. Um, so again, all that kind of camaraderie that happened, you know, within those camps. And then fast forward to, like we talked about, the hunting camps springing up after World War II and up to today, and so much of that is just around family. Um, which again, I talked about in the book there with the Stockard family coming together and I, they were gracious enough to let me hunt out of their camp a couple of times. Um, but as you go to each of those camps, there's a camaraderie within the camps. And like I said, a lot of that is family. Um, but then there's in these little areas where the camps are all together, there's a camaraderie there. And sometimes you might not see that person for a year at a time because you saw them on the first day of hunting season, deer season you know, in one year and then you don't see each other again, but then you're back up there for, for deer season the following year and you drive by or walk over and say, Hey, how'd you, how'd you guys make out? You know, maybe there's a deer hanging on pole. Maybe there isn't whatever. Um, but that camaraderie is its own. And that is so unique to um, those less developed areas, whether it's on the national forest or some of the other places in, in, in very rural and, and wooded Pennsylvania where the camps are um, you just don't, you know, that's camaraderie that you don't see anywhere else. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, that's a really good way to think about it. Like I said, I hadn't, I hadn't really considered that, but I think you're, I think you're onto something there. That's what I, I thought for weeks and try to figure out how to do it. And it just kind of hit me last night. I was, I was just thinking about it and I thought deer camp was, the perfect starting point because you know, I'm a hunter myself. I hunt down here in Somerset. I, you know, I've been there hunting with the groups of guys and stuff, and it's an experience unlike anything else. Yeah, yeah. And then I, I thought sure. that it, it was that way throughout the whole life of the forest, and will be for the, hopefully, the future forever. Yeah, I certainly hope so. And you know, like I, I tell my kids. Uh, when we go into the woods, things change every year. There, there are people who go back to the same camp or, or maybe the same deer stand year after year after year. And, and a lot of times you might get the idea that, well, it's exactly the same as it was last year. But if you look around, things are always changing. Trees are falling, trees are growing, you know, whatever. Th things always, always change on the forest, but, or in the forest. But when you're talking about the the Allegheny National Forest as a whole, a lot stays the same there. I mean, it, the the 
ecosystem changes because it's evolving, growing, changing. It, it is a living thing. Um, and that's never going to stay static. But like you said, hopefully that the fact that it is a national forest and the fact that um, you can't just wantonly, you know, go in and bulldoze it down and put up a, a Walmart or whatever. Uh, not that I have anything against Walmart. I'm probably going to be there a couple hours here this afternoon <laughs> going grocery shopping. But my point is it's not going to get developed. And that, you know, like you said, hopefully that will preserve it for, you know, it's it's 100 years this year. And hopefully in another 100 years and another 100 years after that, people are still enjoying it and celebrating it for, for the great, fantastic resource that it is. And I, I recommend anybody goes up. It's literally a handful of hours from anywhere in the state because it's that big. Yeah. With, yeah. Within a couple hours, you can be there in any part of it and it would take you years to see all of it so i recommend that, everybody goes up and gets at least drive through if nothing else yeah and hey go go in the fall when the leaves are changing and drive through i mean that alone is is worth it uh even if you never get out of the car uh just to drive through and see it and there's so many fantastic areas uh like kinzu bridge state park which is technically not in the forest but it's like just outside of it on the east side um if you're not like me and afraid of heights you can walk out on the bridge and, <laughs> and look down um that spooks me i think my days of of walking out there might be over but i still like to go up there um but yeah places like that uh, minister creek the, the, the waterfalls are there again alligator reservoir i mean there's just so much to see you could never and you're exactly right. You could live up there every day for a lifetime and never have seen all of it. Yeah. So that brings us, we've talked about your book, uh, referenced a hundred times. Where can we find it? Uh, you can grab a copy on Amazon, which is probably the simplest thing that uh, I feel like we're at a point now where most of the population has an Amazon account. Um, you, if not, you should be able to order it through, you know, almost any bookstore um they were they did uh were carrying it stocking it at the uh ranger stations uh at their uh bookstores up on the Allegheny national forest um i haven't been up there for a while so i don't know if they're still sitting on the shelves um but again they should be able to uh if you pop in there and, and ask they should be able to get a copy for you um but simplest way is just uh to uh Hop on the Amazon site and, and order a copy, and you can get it either as an ebook for your Kindle or uh, or paperback. So whatever you whatever you prefer. And I highly recommend it. It's an excellent book. I actually have both the paperback and the ebook copy. Oh, so cool! I, well, I, God I bless you. To, I appreciate yeah, that. <laughs> I, I had to get the ebook copy because I my paperback copy is somewhere somewhere in a, in a shelf i couldn't find it i needed it for right. the show here kind of last minute so, yeah and it but it's such a good book i recommend getting it and it, it's completely off topic but you have a book coming out in the very near future as well don't you uh yes um i'm hoping later this year we'll uh i, I it's gonna require me to finish it first but um uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm uh, nearing completion on a new book. It's going to be called In Freedom Shadow and a uh, total departure from uh, from a season on the Allegheny. It's actually a novel. Um, it is about a, a guy who lived prior to the Civil War, uh, who was a slave in the South on a cotton plantation, um, escaped at the out, at right after the outset of the war, made it across to uh union lines and then was recruited as a spy for um for the federal army and was sent back into the south undercover uh as uh, disguised as a slave uh that's all true story what i everything i just described there his name is john scoble and um so then my um uh, version of that kind of takes that story and tries to flesh it out a little bit. Unfortunately, everything I just described there is pretty much all we know. Um, he was a spy for uh, Alan Pinkerton of the Pinkerton Detective Agency uh, in the first about year and a half of the Civil War. Pinkerton was effectively the spy branch of, of the United States Army. And uh, so anyway, my book takes that and kind of fleshes it out and says, well, 
you know, here's what here's what might have happened in the details there. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm very close to uh, finishing the first draft of that, and we're hoping it'll be uh, out on shelves here later this year. Oh, great! Once you get it finished up, maybe we'll have to do this again for a for a whole new show because I'm I'm a huge Civil War buff. Oh, cool. Well, I, you know, it's kind of funny. I, uh, we used to joke uh, with a friend of mine, friend of mine and I used to joke that there's two kinds of people in this world. There's revolutionary war people and civil war people. Right. And I tend to fall more in the prior category. Uh, you know, the colonial period was always more interesting to me. And then I stumbled across this story and I thought, man, this is, you know, just, a just an unknown story that, that fascinated me. And, uh, so I latched onto it and, uh, yeah, so now I'm I'm maybe changing gears here and I'm switching to more of a civil war person. So. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, Rob, I thank you much for your time. This was a super enjoyable conversation about it. I, I enjoyed it immensely. Well, thanks, Thomas. It was it was a pleasure, and I really want to thank you for having me on and for your kind words about the book. And uh uh yeah, I really appreciate that. And um I'm happy to come back anytime. Wonderful. Thanks again. Take care. Thanks to everybody for listening. Uh, remember, if you like the show, you can share it with all your friends. We can be found on all the major podcast players. Uh, we can be found on Facebook. And you can also find us and catch the show notes at historyfromthehomestead.com. <laughs>